Hello, and welcome to Casual Buddhism. I'm Cindy Rossico, author of Finding Venerable Mother and a devoted follower of Venerable Dhammananda Pikini. Venerable Dhammananda is the first fully ordained Theravada nun in Thailand. She is also the abbess of Song Dhamma Kalyani Temple, located about 40 miles west of Nakong Patom. I should say that's an all female monastery. West, uh, west of Bangkok. West of Bangkok. <laughs> Thank you, Venerable. And, um, and so to, on Casual Buddhism each week, we have a little bit of a new format. I'm inviting guests on and they can come and ask a question uh, relating to their personal life, relating to their Buddhist practice or relating to Buddhism in general. And Venerable Dhammananda will provide answer and conversation back and forth. So today we have Liz, she's our guest and she's going to be asking a question about mindfulness practice. And of course, welcome to Venerable Dhammananda. You know, it's only sharing session, you know. Uh, it, I feel good to share my experience with you. S some of the questions you ask, I may not have experience. I will tell you so. Yes. Thank yes, you. Please, please come, come in. Thank so, you. Yes. Shall I yes, begin? Sorry. I want to start by saying thank you. It's an honor, a true honor for me to have this time with you. I've watched your other casual Buddhism videos and listened to your wisdom, and I'm very honored to be here. Most welcome. Thank you. The question that I have is, um, it has to do with a teaching in Buddhism that we often hear, which is when, where, when something arises that's particularly difficult, a difficult emotion, um, like anger, let's say, or it could be something else, it could be deep sadness or resentment or anything, that we're often told uh, instead of ignoring it or pushing it away, to turn towards it, right? To allow it to be there to turn our attention toward it so that we can learn from it, so that we can get some deeper understanding, some wisdom from what it has to teach us. So I understand that um, and I've experienced it and it, it's a beautiful thing to do. Not always easy, but a beautiful thing to do. And also sometimes uh, we are taught or encouraged to let go, to let things go, to not grasp on tightly. Mm -hmm. So my question is, when do we do, when do we turn towards a difficult emotion and when do we let it go? Uh, this, you know, sometimes that experience was so hurtful that we actually push it down, deep down in our, when it is at the level of conscious mind, it's very disturbing. So we push it down, we hide it in the lower uh, subconscious mind. Sometimes it goes to even unconscious mind. And this, this experience actually arises only when you are in your deep meditation. It arises again. And again, you feel the pain just like when you experience the pain first time, how do we deal with this? How can we just let go of this? You know, you cannot simply let go. That mind, that state of mind has to be deeply anchored in the pasana. You know, once when you can see things as they are, only when your mind is strong enough to see things as they are, then look at it face to face. We have been avoiding it. We have been avoiding it for 30, 40 years. But now with that Buddha mind, you are in that Buddha mind. You are in a stage that you can say, oh, it is this bad experience. This bad experience can be anyone's experience. Does not necessarily have to be mine. When you are in that Buddha mind, you look at it very straight, face it with courage. And then you can let go. 
unless and until your mind is deeply settled in this Buddha nature, let go is not possible. Yes? So yes. That's, why, yeah, that, that's why you need this deep concentration until you get to the level of insight meditation, until you get to the level of you are actually wearing this cloak of Buddha. Mm. Once when you are covered with this Buddha, what you call uh, uh, me, fancy, uh, or radiance, you know, when you are already blessed with the radiance of Buddhahood, then you look at it straightforward, face to face, and then it's just one of those experiences that you can just let go like this, you know, just lift it up and then let go. Then that let go is deep-rooted let go. You know, that experience will not disturb you anymore. Mm. See, so the way it's not easy. It's not easy. No, I, I, yeah. I have some experience myself. You know, the that I have lived with it, hide it, uh, suppress it, something like forty years. You know, unless and until we understand the true nature of it, only then we can really let go. And once when that happens, it does not disturb you anymore. Mm. It does not disturb you anymore. One of that, one of those experiences. This is one of those experiences. You know, I, I, so very much the, the 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 meaning of what Buddhism says: see things as they are. Yes. Yes, see things as they are. Is it seems like such a fundamental and freeing idea, and not so easy to do it's moment by easy. moment. Yeah, very easily said, no, Liz, very easily said, but no, no, very difficult. Unless and until you have been through the experience, you have been through the training, the, this mental training for you to be able to allow yourself to face what had been troubling you for so many years. And then suddenly you realize, oh, you don't have to suffer. It's just one of those experiences. It doesn't even have to be yours. The hurt, the feeling of hurt that you have felt all along, it's because it's your experience. Remove that clinging to your experience mm. and then we can really let go. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. Not hold on to it as ours, our yes. identifying with it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's so helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Liz, you had another question on the nature of Buddha Dharma, I think. Did you want to ask? Well, it's, it's about actually Buddha nature, which you started to, you've talked about here. And the question is, um, you know, the teachings are that everything is impermanent, the teaching of impermanence. Uh, and there's also Buddha nature, which as I understand it, well, here's my question. I, I understand that it's, it's always there. It's always in us. We have Buddha nature. We just cover it up often, right? With our humanness, yes. with our, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion. Um, so is it right to say that Buddha nature is not impermanent, that Buddha nature is an exception to the teaching that all things are impermanent? Oh, very interesting. You know, uh, Nippan, Nirvan, the concept of Nirvan is very much this, uh, talking about this Buddha nature. We're just using different, different terminology. When we explain about this Sankata Dharma, Sankata means things which are composed of, everything in this world is composed of, except Nirvan. Mm -hmm. Things which are composed of are impermanent. Things which are not composed of is asankata dharma. Asankata dharma means it is, uh, it is by itself. It, it does not depend on others. So when you divide things, phenomena in this world into two categories, one that is composed of, another one is not composed of, 
everything in this world is composed of something. As I'm sitting here, I'm composed of the four elements, you know, sitting here. So, so these four elements is talking to these four elements, which is called list, and this one is called Dhammananda. So we, we go through impermanence. We, both of us are subjected to impermanence because we are composed of, we are being composed of, we are dependent on these four elements. But there is yet another type of phenomena. There is another type of thing which is called asankata dharma. Asankata dharma means uh, is to, to negate that which is not composed of. And that which is not composed of, you can call it Buddha nature, you can call it nirvan. Uh, in Pali is Nippan. Yes, so this is how, how, how I can, uh, you know, the, the kind of response that I get right here and now. Yes, I, I understand that's very helpful. It clarifies it for me. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you that, thank you that uh, it helps you to clarify yourself because that's how I explain to myself. I clarified myself. Yes. Thank you. And Liz, we have time for one more question if you'd like to ask. I do have, it's related to what we were just talking about, about Buddha nature. Um, so here in this country, in the West, sometimes we're given the teaching you are perfect as you are. Ah, yes. You are perfect as you are. And I confess to sometimes not knowing what to make of that because I don't feel perfect. I feel very human and imperfect. I feel very uh, conditioned. And uh, yes. so I don't know. Can you help me understand how to hold this notion that we are perfect as we are. Yeah, we are perfect as they are, providing we don't have attachment. <laughs> providing we don't have attachment. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, we have so much attachments, you know. So that perfection is there for you. Yes, that perfection is there for you. You have, you have potentiality to be perfect. All of us, all of us have potentiality to be perfect, but we have to work at it. Yes. Yes. Easier okay. To like that this, is no. <laughs> that is helpful. That is helpful. It's we are perfect and we're also not perfect. True. We have the potential. Yes. And it's not yes. always expressed. Yes. You, yeah. so, so you, you as a lay person, you know, you may see that oh, whenever Dhammananda, you are monastic, so therefore you should have this potentiality. We have equal potentiality, but the access to to allow this potentiality to actualize. Oh, you are as monastic, you will do it better than me. You will do it faster than me. In Buddhism, the answer is no, no. Because when we talk about the mind that is enlightened, we are not talking about this outer form. Enlightened mind can be in lay person or can be in monastic, yes? Well, that, so, that's hopeful. <laughs> yes. So, so what, what actually brings us here is that as we are sitting here, uh, both lay and monastics, we share the same accessibility to this enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And we do have that what is it, unity. We feel the unity among us. So we speak as equal. Spiritually, mm -hmm. we are equal with our potentiality. We do have access to this to this Buddha nature, the same. You have the same access, I have the same access. Let's work for it. Mm. <laughs> well, just being in your presence makes me hopeful. Sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you, Venerable. That was a beautiful uh, program. And I want to thank everyone for joining us and Please, if you have a question or you would like to make a comment, you can contact me at cindyrosico.com or cindy.rosico.author on Facebook. And thank you, Venerable, again, for being here today. And Liz, thank you, yes, so, thank much. you so much. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Liz, for making this session so wonderful and so so loving. I Thank you. So <laughs> Thank you.